So I look better than an old pickup. That's uh, good. I know I look better than Bruce and Diane's vacuum cleaner. Good to see everybody tonight. The storms didn't keep you away. I'm so thankful. And I pray that uh, God will allow the storms to be easy upon us so that we can all make it home safely as well. Such a joy to be at Blue Springs. Thank you very much for the invitation to be with you. As I mentioned, I've been coming to Missouri once, at least once a year for oh, about 34 years. Some of you young people in the audience, I've been coming since before your parents were born. Or I remember some of them when they were your age, little bitty things growing up. They hadn't got any better looking, but they really nice people. And <laughs> That was a joke. I thought I'd get <laughs> some laugh about that. But I love them very much and good to see them. And they're good supporters and always appreciate that. Again, thank you so much. I hope you remember last night's lesson. This is part two. If you weren't here, I'll catch you up just a little bit. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, we read about the church of Christ in Ephesus. Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches in Asia, and we read them right there in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Some of you will recall on Sunday we mentioned how that in Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea could have been a letter written to a lot of churches today, a lot of individuals today when he talked about them being lukewarm. Well, last night we talked about the church in Ephesus. We showed that it was, uh, it seemed like a good, conservative, Bible-believing, working congregation. In fact, in verses 2 and 3 there, Jesus points out they worked and they labored for the Lord. They stood firm against wrong and right. Stood firm for the right and, and stood firm against wrong. And they tested the false prophets, proving they were that. They were false prophets. And yet, with all of these wonderful things about this congregation, and we would say, what a great congregation. And yet Jesus said this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. Thou hast left thy first love. Kind of like the lukewarm thing. Do you recall with the church of Laodicea on Sunday? We talked about somebody saying, well, you know, Jesus could spew me out of my mouth, but... No, there's no buts to that. That's terrible. Someone say, well, here's a good, strong, working current. They just had one thing against them. But it was the thing against them. They had left their first love. And that's not okay. It's not okay to be a working congregation when you lose your first love. It's not okay to, to be generous and, and stand firm for the truth if you lose your first love. That's everything. So that means everything else they had done was worthless and in vain because they didn't do it out of love for God. So how serious that is. I have this against you that you left your first love. How sad. For seemingly such a great congregation to have left their first love. It can happen today. Has it? As a congregation? As an individual Christian? Would Jesus say, you've left your first love? Well, we're involved in a lesson from last night as we continue on tonight asking the question, if that happens to us, what do we do? Well, what we do is what Jesus told them to do. Remember and repent. Repent. And return to your first love. So do that. But we're talking about a fire for the Lord that we've got to have a fire for His cause. How do we get, how do we help God to light that fire again? What do we do? And we're turning to Philippians chapter 3. We're looking at a fourfold pattern here for relighting our fire for God. What do we do? And last night we covered one point. Tonight we're going to cover three. Did I hold up four? We're going to, that one's broke, so it don't matter. We're going, to, we're going to cover three of them because somebody said you better finish tonight because we can't come back to And that's true. We're going to finish this one tonight, Lord willing. Last evening we looked at point number one. We must have a holy dissatisfaction with self in our text. 
Philippians 3 and verse 12, Paul said, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Paul said, I'm not there yet. We talked about that. The great apostle Paul, and yet Paul said, I'm not there yet. And what we've got to guard against is when we can get to the point where we say, well, I've arrived. I'm where I need to be as a Christian. I don't have to do any more. And again, that always happens when you do what? When you start comparing yourself to others. And we always know just exactly who to compare ourselves to, don't we? Oh, well, we don't do what they do, you know. We're not like them. Our kids aren't like them. And we think God compares us like that, and He doesn't. When we compare ourselves, we can get to the point where we say, well, I've arrived. Paul said, I've not yet arrived. I've not yet attained. I'm not there yet. He wanted to continue to grow. And that's where we need to be. Have you already attained? you already there? The answer should be no, I'm not there yet. I'm striving for that. We talked about 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And grow there is, is a continuous thing. We never get to the point where we stop growing. Someone says, yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm 90 years old. I can't do anymore. We're still, listen, I am so encouraged and amazed by some who are there, and yet they're still pushing forward. Still going forward. And that's what we need to do. Because once we stop, we don't hover. We start declining. And so grow is a something continuous. We cannot become satisfied with the status quo. We get that in the church. You know, whatever the status quo is. Remember I, I mentioned this? Here's a brand new convert. Man, they're on fire. They, what else can I do? What, what can I? Give me something to do. And, and, and I heard two men talk about this one time as a young Christian was on fire and said, well, what's the matter with him? And the other one said, don't worry, he'll learn. What do you mean he'll learn? He'll learn to sit down and be quiet and just go along with everybody else. I pray not. Stay on fire for God. In fact, how long has it been since you were like that? Let some new convert outdo us. Let some new convert be on fire more than we ought to be on fire. Something's wrong with that. We've got to continue on. Instead, we strive every day to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And like Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 10, I want to know Him. Here's Paul, the apostle. Listen, you met him on the road, right? Yeah. But Paul says, I want to know Him. And the power of His resurrection... Don't you want to know Him? Don't you want Him more? know Him more and more every day? That's the part about having a holy dissatisfaction with self. I've not attained. I'm not there yet. Don't ever think that you are. Our title of our lesson this for these two lessons was Relight My Fire, O God, or whatever Don said. Second, we must have a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord. If we're really going to be on fire for the Lord, if we're going to have a zeal and a passion for God and for holy things, then we must have a wholehearted devotion. Notice what Paul says in verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Boy, when you read about the Apostle Paul, and the greatness of this man through Jesus Christ. And yet Paul said, this one thing I do. There's a wholehearted devotion. To what? Striving to truly seek the kingdom first. That's where Paul was. And all of his emphasis was upon who? Not upon what, but upon who? On Jesus Christ. You get that from it. Everything he writes. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I can do all things through Christ. So his main goal was to push on to God and, and heavenly things through Jesus Christ. Notice how the Bible has a lot to say about that emphasis, that one goal, and especially on one person. Back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. If we just did that, 
say, well, that's over in the Old Testament. Yeah, if we just did that today. Remember when we talked about the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10? Came to Jesus, running to Jesus. Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Just keep the commandments. He said, I've done this since my youth. You know what Jesus actually says there? No. You missed the very first one. What's that? Loving God. Because what did He love? He loved His money. Jesus looked into His heart and said, there's something that's standing between you and God and you better be willing to get rid of it. Did Jesus tell you go sell it all you have before you could be a Christian? He didn't tell us that. But He does tell us if there's anything that's standing between you and God, you better get rid of it. You better be willing to sacrifice it. It's not worth your soul. So this young man, yeah. And Jesus said what? Go and sell all you have. But he went away sorrowful. Because he didn't want to have that kind of devotion, did he? No, he had devotion all right, but it was to the wrong thing. Luke 10, 42, Jesus speaks of Mary. Remember the sister of Martha? Jesus had come to their house. Mary was sitting at his feet. Martha was concerned, you know, want to get some things ready, get some things prepared, dinner, whatever, get those things taken care of. And, and, and Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken from her. The good part was what? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what He said. Yeah, all those other things could be important, but there was a time for that. Jesus said, no, Mary chose the good part. That was studying at the feet of Jesus. John chapter 9, the blind man being questioned by the Pharisees because they were they wanted to find out how this miracle happened that this man could see. He couldn't see before. Now he can see. And the blind man said, One thing I know. Once I was blind, but now I see. We need to be that same kind of people today so that we have a single focus, a single outlook. Not what is it, but who is it. You know, we got a lot of what's in our lives, don't we? What about this? What about that? What about a single focus, a single outlook on who? Jesus Christ. One of my favorites, Psalm 27 and verse 4. Psalmist said, One thing I have desired of the Lord. That one thing will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. We need that kind of passion, that kind of desire today. Wholehearted. What does that mean? I think it may be, you know, we get a lot of new words today uh, that aren't even in our dictionary, you know. And, uh, but what about this word? This isn't a new word. Do we know what it means? How about this? How about putting everything else aside for a change? What usually happens? Oh well, I got a lot of things, you know. I got, I got a dog. I got a, something. This I got that, and we put everything else. We put, we put the Lord and His worship and His study and those kind of. We put those things aside because we got a lot of things out here. How about putting those things aside and put Christ first for a change? How about putting everything else on the back burner instead of the Lord and His call? Is that wholehearted? That would be wholehearted. Wholehearted devotion to God and holy things. Matthew 6.33, you can't get much more wholehearted than this, can you? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things. All what things? You just got through talking about all the things the Gentiles fret and worry about. Food, shelter, and all those things. Jesus said, you seek me first. Kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe that wholeheartedly. Do you really have the kingdom, God, Jesus, your relationship with Him as the goal in your life? Goal-oriented. We want to set a goal, right? We want goals. Well, where's Jesus fit in on your goals? You know, we can... We can become devoted to so many things, it tears us apart, doesn't it? You know what I'm talking about. We all get there. We get so divided when we put all these things into our lives. 
Yes, there's a lot of things in your life, in my life. There are lots of things. But we can't let them divide us from our wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ. We can't. And yet so many people allow that. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 12.30, If you're not with me, you're against me. And in Mark 12 and verse 30, Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. All your soul. All your mind. All your strength. We talked about it Sunday. Is God pleased with a, with a part of your life? Just, just give me a part. Just, just throw me something, just a little bit here and there, and God will be pleased with that. He never has been and He never will be. It's first with God or it's Nothing. Well, yeah, when I there's a time in my life I'll get there, but I'm not there yet. Are you striving for it? Remember, James said in James 1 and verse 8, we're not to be double minded. What happens when you're double minded? He says you're unstable in all your ways. It's like the man on a ship, and he doesn't quite have his footing, and for a while he's over here, and then for a while he's over. And that's the same way a lot of people are with the Lord. For a while, yeah, I'm on fire. I want to be for Him. And then in the next day, it's over here. And then we're back over here. And then we're back over here. And you see why James says he's unstable in all of his ways? That's what happens when you and I get double-minded. When we take our mind off the goal. The goal of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have a wholehearted devotion to God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 7.35. Paul wrote, and this I say for your own profit, not that I put a leash on you, this is New King James Version, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord, notice this, you may serve the Lord without distraction. Who is he talking to? Man, i got more distractions? You do, don't you? There's lots of them. And yet Paul said, I want you to serve the Lord without distraction. We must make sure that we get to heaven without distraction. We cannot be divided among many things. We must have a wholehearted devotion. Yes, there are things I've got to take care of in my life. But you can look in your own heart. But yet I have a wholehearted devotion. Doesn't mean I can't do something else. There are lots of things I must do to be a good husband, a good father, all these things, be a good Christian. There are things I must do, but it all revolves around Jesus Christ and what He wants for me. Relight my fire, O God. Paul said there's a third part, and that is an upward direction in life. Not only do we have a holy dissatisfaction with self, and by the way, that's not talking about self-esteem. You know, you start talking about people say, well, you said I'm not supposed to have self-esteem. That's not talking about that. Just read what Paul says about it. A holy dissatisfaction in what I am. I've not arrived yet. I'm still pressing on. I think we sang that song the other night. Not only that, but a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. But we must also thirdly have The upward direction in life. Upward direction. People say, well, you can't look up all the time. In fact, one time I was looking down, I found a $20 bill. Sometimes I'll look up and I trip or step on a snake, Becky. Look up to heaven. Think about the words here, Paul says, Philippians 3, about this upward direction. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forward to those things that are before, what? I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says we must have an upward direction. He put other things behind so that he could reach forward to those things that were before, ahead. What do we mean by that? Three points. Subdivision, okay? 
Three steps that a person must take to have an upward direction. We must be willing, first of all, to look up toward heaven rather than down towards the world. You know what I mean by that. So easy right now to get so discouraged with all this political stuff, isn't it? No, don't you just almost get sick at your stomach? Why then do we let that do that to us? I remember back in election not too long ago, I pulled into the parking lot on Wednesday. Tuesday was the election. Pulled in on Wednesday, and I just stopped the car, turned it off, put my hands on the steering wheel, and let out a big... I, and Susie said, what are you going to say? I said, I don't know. I am so disheartened. I am so discouraged. And being the wife that she is, she said, isn't God in control? I said, oh man, yes, and I know that. But how many times do we forget it every time we watch that junk on the TV? How come we get so animated, right? Why? Isn't God in control? Yeah. I know He's going to bless me. Don't you know He'll bless you if you do His will? We can look down and become sad and depressed. Or the Bible tells us over and over again. Colossians 3 and verse 1, Paul said, If then ye be risen with Christ, what? Seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. We get all of our attention down here. It's, it's going to be very depressing. It could discourage us in our Christian life. And we can't allow that. So we look up. We look to heaven. How can we truly have an upward direction in life? One way is to constantly think about that eternal reward. We like rewards, don't we? Some of you... We'll even go charge a bunch on your check on your uh, car, credit card so you can get those rewards. We like rewards, don't we? How about this reward? An eternal life reward. Think about that. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Think about heaven. What? No more death? No more sorrow? No more crying? No more pain? The former things are passed away? Why do you think that's there? So I'll look at it. Paul would write in Romans 8 and verse 18, this world doesn't even begin to compare with the beauty and the joy that awaits us. So we have to look up. Make sure we have our eyes toward heaven and that it is our goal. Look up. Step two. We must be willing to let go. Again, the encouraging words by Paul 13 and 14, forgetting those things which are behind. Have a hard time with that, don't we? Yeah, it's forgetting, but then what? Reaching forward to those things that are before. It's not just forgetting. Now you've got to reach forward. Sometimes we don't do that. We're not there. If we're really going to have an upward direction in life, we not only have to look up, but we also cannot look back. We must let go of the past. How many people do you know, you, you may be sitting next to them, living in the past? We do that sometimes, don't we? But it's not good for us. Living in the past. Sometimes we get focused on the things that I have done in the past. Or things that have been done to me in the past. I've done that. I've been guilty of that on occasion. And we allow them to keep us from really serving God. It'll happen. You know what really helps us to let go of our past? And we're talking about the sins in our past. You know how, what really helps us to let go? What has God done? What will God do? with those past sins. You say, well, He, he gets rid of them. <laughs> That's not even touching on what the Bible says God does. Listen to this. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. God is a God, who is a God like you? 
pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of His heritage. Listen, it's a remnant that's going to repent and, and be what God wants them to be. That's the, that's the sins God forgives those who repent of those things, who obey Him, who follow Him. Okay, That's who the remnant are. He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in mercy. We don't see God like that. We see God's just waiting for us to mess up. We don't see God like the Bible says. He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And we say, oh yeah, God gets rid of our sins. <laughs> That's not even close to what He... He cast them to what? The depths of the sea. You're not fishing for them. They're gone. Psalm 103, 10 through 12. I hope you're getting these verses down. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him as far as the east is from the west. So far has He removed our transgressions from us. I know you've heard this before. He didn't say from north to south. He said from east to west. You know, we start traveling north and we'll only go so far before what? Before now we're going to be traveling south. There's a limitation on that. But if you start right here in Blue Springs, Missouri and just travel east, how far can you go? You can go and go and go and go. You can travel east forever. What's, what's the Bible saying? He's forgiven our sins not as far as north to south. There's a limit to that. He's forgiven our sins as far as east is from west. You just go east as long as you want to go. It helps us let go of our past to know when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ that God, He doesn't just get rid of them. I mean, they're, they're in the depths of the sea. There's no limit. It's gone. Hebrews 8 and verse 12, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. God says, I forget them. If God forgets, if God gets rid of those past sins, we must too. So we look up. We let go. Let go. And then third step, we lay aside. Lay aside. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. We're surrounded by so, such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Christians, we not only look up, we not only let go, but we've got to lay aside anything that might hinder us from following God. You know, people who are running races, they don't wear the heaviest clothes. They run wear the lightest clothes and shoes. But let me pause just this. Just let me add this. But they wear clothes! I get tired of the world telling Christians, no, if you're going to go run or something, you got to get naked! you got to take off all your clothes. It's ridiculous. Oh, but you got to be streamlined. I'm going to say a name here. Many of you are going to go, huh? some of you will go, oh yeah, Flo Jo. Flo Jo, she couldn't make up her mind. She wanted to wear clothes or not. So she wore one leg with, with clothes on it and the other leg was bare. And I just wonder, when she was setting all those records, was her... Was her leg with clothes on going a little slower than the leg that was naked? You know, I don't understand that. Young people, don't let these people tell you when you run in races, well, this is how you got to dress. Let God tell you how to dress. And when it comes to racing, you wear lightweight. You don't wear the heavy stuff because it can be a hinder. Well, the idea here is that sin is the weight that what? It causes us not to run the race the way God wants us to. Not the best we can. Therefore, we must lay aside every weight 
and the sin that does so easily beset us. Maybe, maybe you don't have the passion for Jesus that you ought to have because there's sin in your life, in your heart. And that's the hinder. After all we talk about and all the Bible says about how God takes it away, removes it, how can we not allow Him to do that by doing what He said? I tell you this, that if there is sin in your life that has not been taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ, I guarantee you that you will never, never, never be where God expects you to be. And you won't make it to that finish line. With God. Lay aside your sin by repenting of that sin, making it right before God so that you can run, the New King James says, with endurance the race that has been set before you. Relight my fire, O God. Fourthly, we must have an inward determination. Here's a child of God who perhaps finds himself, he doesn't have the fire for God that he knows he needs to have. He's lukewarm. So what does he do? Repent of those things. Now what? Well, have that holy dissatisfaction with self. I've not arrived. Have that wholehearted devotion, one goal, one meaning in our lives, looking to heaven so that we can put our focus where it belongs and we must have an inward determination. We must decide, I'm going to serve God and nothing is going to stop me. And the devil says, oh yeah? That's a challenge to him. He's going to throw everything he can to trip you up. Listen one more time to Paul in Philippians 3.14 and notice the inward determination as Paul writes, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is this inward determination? I press toward. Heaven was something for which he was actively striving. It was his goal. It was his focus. Paul was striving to go to heaven. Are we? If we're really going to have a passion for Jesus, we've got to be determined not to let anything get in the way. And there's lots of things that are vying to get in the way. And Jesus put it this way to that church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, you be faithful unto death. And I'll give you the crown of righteousness. We must be faithful to Jesus in every way, even to the point of death. That's the only way that we're going to know that we're right with Christ. Do you have an inward determination today? Are you really, truly, honestly determined that the most important thing in your life is serving Jesus Christ, glorifying God, and going to heaven. Is Jesus your goal? Is heaven your focus? Think again about the words of Paul we mentioned a moment ago in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'll never forget this illustration. Preacher put up on the board. For me to live is blank. And to die is blank. Well, I knew what the Scripture said. I, I knew what you're supposed to fill in. He said, now let's fill it in where a lot of people are. For me to live is my job. Well, what happens if you die? It's loss. It's gone. You don't have it anymore. You know, when you think nobody can replace you, guess what? They just did. For me to live is my car. What happens when you die? It goes up for auction. <laughs> it's gone. It's not gain, it's loss. 
For me to live is my family. What happens when you die? It's loss. The only thing that fits so that it's gain is what? Christ. The only thing. Now what are you erasing and putting there? Whatever it is, it's not gain, it's loss. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. As a Christian, if this is our goal, then we must remain faithful in every area of our life. Holy dissatisfaction with self. I'm not there. Wholehearted devotion. My one goal. My purpose. Upward direction. How important to be looking up. An inward determination. Have you got it? Are you on fire for God? I'm thinking that it's possible that there are those in our audience tonight who may be visiting with us, who maybe they're thinking to themselves, you know, I that's the kind of passion that I, I'd like to have in my life. I want to have that passion for the Lord. I really want to serve God. But you're not yet a Christian, and you know that in order to have this passion, this fire for God, you've got to have a relationship with the Lord. You've got to be obedient to Him. And friend, you can have this kind of relationship with the Lord if you'll obey the Gospel. You can have it tonight. God will put that fire in your heart. Again, I don't light your fire. You don't light your fire. God's Word can light your fire if you'll obey Him. Maybe you're asking, how do I do that? Just like the day the New Testament church was established. You read about it in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches that sermon. God had made the Lord Jesus both Lord and Christ, but you've crucified Him. They were pricked in the heart, Acts 2 and verse 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 3,000 of them obeyed the Gospel, were baptized. And verse 47 says, And the Lord added them to His church, His body, His saved people. You know, if you ask us today, what do I need to do? There's a lot of answers out there. And one of the most frequent answers is, why well, just accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Say this prayer, ask Him into your heart, and He'll save you. But what you need to do is open up your Bible and say, that's great if that's what the Bible says. Does the Bible say that? You'll not find that anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. Wait, wait. Millions of people are told that all the time. But it's not in the Bible. If you ask us in the church of Christ, well, what do you say you need to do? We just say what the Bible says. Acts 2 and verse 38. We'll tell you the same thing. They told them that day, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. The Lord will save you. He'll add you to His body of saved people. You can't join it. He'll add you to it. We'll tell you the same thing. You can do the same thing and you can be the same thing they were. Saved and a part of the Lord's body. Saved body. You could do the same thing tonight. And we pray that you will. God loves you. You can have that fire in your heart for God in His Word if you'll obey Him. And Jesus said, if you love Me, keep My commandments. John 14, 15. And Jesus, one of Jesus' commandments was, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 and verse 16. Love Him. And obey Him. To those of us who have already done that, I close tonight's lesson with how we began this series. I ask our Christians, brothers and sisters tonight, are you on fire for God? Or are you lukewarm? Is it in your heart to say, 
O God, relight my fire. Right now, as together we stand and as we sing. Who left the door?